Hi, and welcome to the video lecture for module 12, where we'll be talking about Baroque art in Northern Europe. We'll be talking about a couple of different areas today. First, we're going to start by talking about France, specifically looking at a couple of images and a monumental piece of architecture produced at the court of Louis XIV, the Sun King. Then we'll move on to talking about a part of Northern Europe that actually stays Catholic, and that is Flanders. And we'll be looking specifically at a work by Peter Paul Rubens, who's a very famous artist of the 17th century. And then finally, we'll spend most of our time today talking about the Dutch Republic, what is modern day the Netherlands or Holland. And there we'll see the idea of Protestant art and the fact that there's a very wealthy middle class. So these are Protestants. There are some religious works that are produced, but for the most part, they turn to secular subjects. And that's mostly what we, what we will be talking about with them. So let's go ahead and get started. Just to show you the areas exactly that we're talking about, here we have a map of Europe in about 1648, so right in the middle of the 17th century. We're going to be focusing on France here. You see the Kingdom of France is fairly well unified and not that different than what it looks like today. It's a little bit larger today. We'll also be looking at the area up here called Holland, centered around Amsterdam, this major port city where Lots and lots of Dutch ships go out. The Dutch become very wealthy through shipping and trade. And we'll also be talking just a little bit about the Spanish Netherlands, this area called Flanders. So Spain's empire extended through a couple of different patches as the remnants of what used to be the Holy Roman Empire. You can see it here is quite fragmented in this dark yellow here. After Charles V in the 16th century, it gets split up even more. But you can see that Spain has quite a far reach up into northern Europe, but also into Sardinia and southern Italy here. So for a long time, this is under Spanish domain. Even around Milan, you've got a Spanish political system there. So I want to start today by talking about King Louis XIV. And here I'm showing you a portrait of the king. Louis XIV is the king known as the Sun King, the Roi Soleil. He had a massive, impressive court. And he built the Palace of Versailles into what we know it today. The court had been centered in Paris, and he decided to move it out to the suburbs of Paris. The Louvre actually was the palace of the French kings. Now we think of it as an art museum, but it was a royal palace for centuries. Louis XIV is probably the best example we have of an absolute ruler, an absolute monarchy. And this is the main thing I want you to remember about Louis. He was known for having said, l'état et moi, I am the state. He and his advisors made France the most powerful and populous nation in Europe. So around the time of Louis XIV, you start to have a shift outside of Italy as the dominant political and artistic center. The popes start to lose some power. The art world follows political power. So we see that transferred to France starting in the 18th century specifically. One thing that Louis did was to establish an art academy in order to create a national style. And this academy lasts for centuries, and we'll be talking about it in much more detail in the future, but it is started under Louis XIV. So he decided to move his court to Versailles, as I said, and we'll look at an image from Versailles. This is an area 15 miles outside of Paris, and he didn't just move his family there and his servants, he moved the entire government there. So it becomes the major center of political power in France, so the suburb of Paris. Paris is still the capital, but Versailles is where all of the action is happening. So I wanted to show you this portrait to give you a sense of how art can convey certain ideas about rulership. And this is something we've talked about with almost every single culture that we've discussed so far. The artist here, Hyacinth Rigaud, he was a very adored artist by his entire court. And Rigaud helps formulate what a state portrait should be. And this is the exemplum of that. While this is a portrait of the king, Rigaud's purpose was not to express Louis's character or likeness, but to glorify the monarchy. That's the primary goal of this portrait. This painting became so popular that he had many, many copies made, both in full and half-length formats, often with the help of assistants. I'm showing you the original, which was meant to be sent as a gift to King Philip V of Spain, but it was so well liked that it actually didn't get sent. We see Louis garbed in his ceremonial coronation robes. He's in this very elegant, balletic stance. And he has this very haughty expression to proclaim his exalted status. He's looking down at us as the viewer. Now, this is a, a portrait that's so large that the king appears uh, about life size. 
even though the emphasis here is on this portrait of the king, Rigaud remains concerned with the details, describing the king's costume very carefully, even down to the intricacy of the shoe buckles that you see in his nice little high-heeled shoes. This is the epitome of a portrait of an absolute ruler. Note his balletic stance, where his, he's showing off his legs, which were said to be his best feature, basically. He also was a major patron of ballet, and it really rises in France under his reign. He is, in a way, on display himself. So it's not unlike what we saw with Holbein with King Henry VIII, but it's a very different approach to just having the king dominate the scene like Holbein chose to do, although the king does dominate. It's not in the same physical way. There's a lot of things included to make that scene even more impressive. He's set against this billowing curtain. He's swathed in these huge coronation robes that's covered in the fleur-de-lis of France. You see all these golden lily shapes that is the symbol of France, and it's lined with ermine. And then if you look into the background, you start to see this column base, what looks to be even more classicizing architecture here. So it's this noble antique setting. He's surrounded by the ceremonial objects of his rule. He's got the crown seated on this stool over here. The royal scepter has been turned upside down, and he's using it almost, to, it almost looks like a walking stick. And then here we see with quite some prominence, what's called the Sword of Charlemagne, which was used in the coronation ceremonies of the kings of France. It was said to have belonged to Charlemagne. So I want to talk just a little bit about this Palace of Versailles. We're going to focus on one specific room, but I wanted to show you this painting from the late 17th century that shows the palace and its grounds. So you can see just how extensive it is. It's a massive complex of the palace that we see in the foreground. You see the main court here, the ceremonial entryway, and then these huge wings of the palace. And then the gardens stretch on for what seems like forever. It's very carefully organized gardens, lots and lots of water features. There's other residences on site. Uh, it's a really fantastic, huge, magnificent setting for the court of France. It was the previous site of a hunting lodge which had been built in 1624, and it was first enlarged from 1631 to 1636. It was enlarged even more from 1661 to 1708. It contains hundreds of rooms, and it served more than 20,000 people. There were 4,000 servants who lived there, in addition to the rest of the court, the king and his family and his friends. But the room I want to focus on is this one called the Hall of Mirrors. I'm showing you its French title, the Galerie des Glaces. In the 17th century, it was known as La Grande Galerie, the large gallery, and it primarily served as a passageway and a waiting area for those visiting the palace. Courtiers spent time there along with visitors. At either end, you have one room called the, the Room of Peace, and the other end is the Room of War. And it's said that Louis would take people in to have conversations depending on what his mood was like. That's how he would pick what room he wanted to be in. It's 73 meters long, and it's glorifying the success of France. So there's 30 separate paintings in the barrel vault showing the history of Louis XIV and his government, all painted by Charles Le Brun, whose name you see up in the title here. In total, the left wall, left in this image, features 357 mirrors. So you've got these large arched mirrors, but these are all individually cut pieces of glass here. And this is a sign of economic prosperity. There was a new emphasis on production of mirrors in France, and mirrors were a luxury object that had been previously produced almost exclusively in Venice. On the other side of the room, opposite the mirrors, is this long row of windows, which overlook the gardens behind the palace. This is a way of showing the king's control over nature. This is one thing that art historians talk pretty extensively about the gardens, how carefully controlled they are to show that the king doesn't just have control over the government or France, but also nature itself. It brings the outdoors into the space because these, there are so many windows and they're so large. And the mirrors reflect that nature back into the room. Also, the mirrors reflect sunlight. And remember, King Louis is the sun king. So in this room, we have this opulence, wealth, and ostentation, which is a hallmark of almost any royal court. But it's a real strong characteristic of the court of Louis XIV and some of the subsequent kings of France. It's this glorious space 
and it's only, it was only used for courtly ceremonies on rare occasions. It's all about impressing the visitors, since this really was only the waiting room or the gathering area. This isn't even where you would spend that much time. This was a passageway, essentially. And look at how much went into decorating this space. So now let's move out of France and talk a bit about Flanders. We're going to be focusing on this image for Flanders, this painting by Peter Paul Rubens. In Flanders, the Catholic Church remained the primary patron. Rubens was one of the most prolific painters of the period. He worked for everyone. He worked for the church. He worked for private citizens. He worked for the nobility, civic patrons, and he traveled extensively to other courts, including time spent in Italy, France, and England. Everywhere he went, people wanted him to work for them. So uh, some of his major patrons included the Duke of Savoy, centered around the city of Turin in Italy. He worked for the Queen of France, uh, Marie de Medici, and he worked for the King of England, Charles I. So everybody liked Rubens, and in a lot of ways he's, he's like Bernini in that way. He even worked in all of his travels as a diplomat for his patrons. So he was he was very well liked, and he was employed not just for artistic reasons, but also for political purposes. He ran a very successful and large workshop, and he dealt with the art market as well. So he has his hand in a lot of things. During his time in Spain, we know he even interacted with Velazquez at the Spanish court of Philip IV. So he knew a lot of the other artists who were working in Europe at that time. He even, in Italy, he spent some time in Rome and paints a couple of altarpieces. While he's there, one of Caravaggio's paintings that gets rejected by its patron, Rubens works out the contract for his patron so that he buys the Caravaggio painting and has it sent to Turin in northern Italy. What I'm showing you here is a large scale altarpiece called the Raising of the Cross. And now you can find it in Antwerp Cathedral, but it was originally in the Church of St. Walburgus. It dates to 1610 to 1611. As you see, we have another triptych, which is a very common format that we've seen for altarpieces. And remember, this triptych is a three-part altarpiece. And in the center, we see the scene where it derives its name from, the raising of the cross. So in the center, he's chosen the most important moment, the raising of the cross during Christ's crucifixion. But notice how well all three panels work together. It's a continuous background among them. The figures in the outer panels are looking towards the inner panels. They're interacting, although it is not quite as dramatic as this central panel. So let's look just at this central panel for a moment. This is a very explicitly religious work. This is the dramatic moment in Christ's passion as he's going from the ground to being upright on the cross, this moment of a lot of tension. You see the, the muscles of the figures who are hauling that cross up. It's in a very dramatic position. We see some interesting formal concerns with Rubens, that very strong diagonal that you see with Christ and the cross that he's on, and also the bodies of the figures hauling the cross up. That diagonal is very characteristic of the Baroque. Nearly everything is in line with this diagonal, from the arms of those hauling it up to the cliffside in the background, the rope that this figure is pulling the body of Christ that's all about that diagonal. It's a sort of tense position because you don't know if he's gonna, if they're going to make it up all the way, if he's going to fall to the ground. So it's a, a very carefully selected moment for the highest drama possible. Christ in the center is illuminated. Notice that in this part, in this panel, he is the only good guy. If we look to the outside, on the left side, you see the, the Marys and some of the other apostles who are observing the crucifixion. These are the holy figures, but they're not in that dramatic central panel. So Christ is illuminated because he's the most important and he's the good guy here. He gazes towards heaven in a relatively serene expression, which is in high contrast to all of the figures around him. And it's this nice play on the idea that Christ is the light of the world. The muscular figures show Rubens' interest in naturalism, but it goes beyond that because it's, it's, it's more dramatic than it has to be. I mean, these figures are rippling with muscles. You see him trying to make the scene a little bit more real by adding this dog below, which I think gives it this sort of contemporary appeal. Otherwise, the crucifixion is sort of outside of time, but having that dog there is a sort of connection for the viewer to make. So Rubens is known for his dramatic religious scenes, 
And also he worked extensively in mythological scenes, portraits, genre scenes. He also did engravings. He was a prolific printmaker, a lot like Durer. So he's a very important artist for this period. Lots of other artists saw his work and were influenced by him, and he impacted the art world in several different countries. So he's a very important artist for the 17th century. Now I'd like to move on to the Dutch Baroque, so moving on to the Dutch Republic. And we'll stay on this image while I give you some background here, because they're culturally quite different than Italy, than France, than even Flanders. They're very close neighbors. During the 16th century, there was a lot of religious upheaval in the region that's now northern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The Protestant factions in the north vied for independence, leading to what are called the Wars of Religion. It was this long and violent period of violence in which Spain, who at this time was in control of the region, attempted to enforce Catholicism. By the early 17th century, the northern provinces had their freedom from Spain, and were split between Catholic and Protestant camps, essentially creating what is now Belgium and the Netherlands. The Netherlands was a prominent center for trade and publishing during the 17th century. They became a wealthy nation with a large middle class and a ruling patrician class. Its primarily Protestant composition led to trends of secular subjects in art, that is such things as portraits, landscapes, and still lives. We also see a distinct interest in seeing subjects of themselves or of their daily life and surroundings. Protestants thought that art in churches could lead to idolatry, idolatry, and thus we have that cycle with iconoclasm, and they thought there were many better things for the church to be spending its money on. These different aspects of their society led to a vibrant open art market where artists and studios could produce works without commission. Now, of course, there are still lots of works that are commissioned. We'll talk about a few but they could paint whatever they wanted and then try to sell it. The high demand for art led to numerous reproductions of pieces either in the form of oil duplicates or through etching and engraving created most often in a workshop system. Some religious paintings are created in the north. For example, Rembrandt does a number of religious works, but this is largely due to the, to the tolerant nature of Dutch Protestants, but we see much more emphasis on secular works of art. So as I said, they had a very strong middle class. Part of this was through their sea trade and their international trade in Europe. This led to a lot of material wealth and the interest in purchasing luxury products, not just paintings, but also furniture and porcelain. So even though the subject matters are quite different and the people buying art are quite different than what we saw in Italy or France for that matter, we still see some important similarities stylistically. So this idea of the Baroque still works in the Dutch Republic. There's this interest in naturalism, rendering figures, light and shadow accurately and according to nature. And again, this interest in engaging the viewer. They are understanding the role of the audience for artworks continues to be important abroad in Europe during this period. So it's not just a counter-reformation thing. In the Baroque, they really want to draw in the viewer, use diagonals, use dramatic scenes, dramatic lighting, in order to attract the viewer. We're going to start by talking about Rembrandt van Rijn. He was one of the most important painters of the Dutch Republic. He spent most of his career in Amsterdam, and he was a prolific painter and etcher. He painted portraits, landscapes, and some remarkable biblical paintings as well. This is probably his most famous work, now called The Night Watch. That's just what it came to be known as, mostly in the 19th century. It's a bit of an erroneous title, and we'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. The title, The Night Watch, refers to the subdued lighting, and it led art critics to seek all manner of hidden mysteries in the painting. The original title of the painting is recorded in the family chronicle of the central figure, and it sounds really boring by comparison with the Night Watch. In the Chronicle, because there was a sketch of this work as well that the family owned, this is how they characterized it. Sketch of the painting from the Great Hall of Claveneers Dolin, in which the young Herr van Pummerland, who is Franz Benningkock in the very center here, as captain, orders his lieutenant, the Herr van Flederdingen, who is William van Rotenburg, right here in yellow, to march the company out. So sometimes you'll also see this referred to as the company of Captain Franz Benningkock, the central figure in the black hat. What it is is a group portrait, and we see the captain of the group, this militia group, in the foreground wearing black with this white ruff, 
and he's making this gesture to his lieutenant who is wearing yellow. Rembrandt's group portrait is set apart from comparable paintings in his use of chiaroscuro. So Rembrandt never went to Italy, but his teacher did. So his teacher had been exposed to the works of Caravaggio. He uses this chiaroscuro as a dramatic device. So the figures, this militia troop, is emerging from the darkness. This was actually supposed to have been taking place during the day, not at night, but the chiaroscuro makes it seem like it's happening at night. This probably isn't representing an actual event, but rather is actually just a group portrait of these figures. We see a, a huge repertoire in, of portrait poses and gestures from Rembrandt's store of figures. So you see all this different activity going on. You think they're about to march forward. This almost certainly didn't take place like this. It's just Rembrandt composing a group portrait in an interesting way. This is not the only group portrait painting that exists in Holland at this time. Lots and lots of them are produced of different guilds, of different militia groups, of different government groups. And we see them take this really dramatic turn and this strong interest in showing the portrait of everyone, but making them really dynamic. For example, I'm showing you here a group portrait from the Netherlands dated to 1529. And you can see how rigid these could be, where basically it just feels like a lining up of faces. Everybody looks a little bit different, but everybody looks bored. You've got a lot of weird gestures, but there's not a lot of action in the painting. By contrast, Rembrandt is all about the action. He makes it almost all of his figures look like they're moving. You can get a real sense of this hubbub going on. You can hear this guy drumming. You see all these lances. You can hear the wind blow through the flag. This guy is cleaning out his musket. There's a lot of action. Everybody's stepping forward. It really captures the activity of the group, showing the members in various stages of preparing their weapons as they gather for a parade. This was done for the Musketeers Hall in Amsterdam, and it was one of only six paintings that various civic groups commissioned for this space. So this would have been displayed with five other group portraits in a single room. Now one figure has proven to be very interesting in this painting, and that's the figure of the little girl here. She seems to be carefully illuminated, and there has been all sorts of attempts to identify who she might be, what she might represent, and it's generally thought that maybe she's supposed to be some sort of mascot of the group. Do you see that she has this chicken hanging from her belt? Well, the chicken actually refers to the lieutenant Franz Benning Koch, because that word Koch is the same word for chicken in Dutch. So that's probably why she's shown here, this little mascot figure. And it's just the way that Rembrandt chooses to let the light fall onto the space. There's a lot more to say about this painting, and there's some really interesting videos you can see about more interpretations of this work. It's been famous basically since it was painted. It's an enormous work, so when you're standing in front of it, it feels like they're all about to march out of the painting right at you. It's well worth seeing, so if you're ever headed to Amsterdam, stop by the Rijksmuseum and have a look at this painting. It's really dynamic, and reproductions don't quite do it justice because it's such a large, active painting, which is exactly what Rembrandt was trying to do. Another artist I want to talk about is Franz Hals, and here we see another common genre in the Dutch Republic, and that is individual portraits. Franz Hals was from the city of Harlem, and he specialized in portraiture. This was really one of the only kinds of possible commissions in the Dutch Republic since there were no public religious commissions. You have private portraits, you have group portraits, almost everything else is up to the artist to make, and then people would go buy it on the open art market. Hals is known for these portraits of individual figures. And he's really well known for his very lively brushwork. So hopefully you can see this in this reproduction, but the brush strokes are very visible, especially in the black swaths of drapery, in this lace ruff that he's wearing, in the individual hairs of this fantastic mustache. It's a very active brush stroke, so it feel it makes the figure seem even more alive. He has this ability to manipulate brushwork and light and shadow. So the brushwork here is not only used for forms, but it also adds to the mood and personality of the sitters. He was a master at rendering faces. So in this work, we have this light source coming in from the left, and it really moves you through the space. So you see the light falling right on the face of the cavalier, 
and then you see his shadow cast over here. So it's all part of balancing out this composition. This is a portrait, although notice I'm not identifying the figure. We don't actually know who it represents, but based on the way he's dressed, he's a cavalier, a knight. Halls is really able to convey a certain exuberance in his works, which is enhanced by this jaunty pose that the cavalier assumes with his hand on his hip, the ruffling of the clothing. You've got a lot of different textures going on, and he's interested in surface textures, much like earlier Northern European artists, but he's not trying to make it look that real. Remember, the brush stroke makes it more lively and not just as this really careful rendering of the textures of the fabric. He's set at an oblique angle, which is something that makes it really Baroque. So he's turned a little bit away from us, but looking towards us. It makes his gaze a little bit more interesting. Notice that he's not really laughing, but that upturned mustache adds this liveliness and seems to give the impression that he is laughing. So with Halls, we've got this interest in the surface detail, but also textural variation. The visual brush strokes is a way of not making the artist disappear. So it's not exactly a window like somebody like Caravaggio. The artist is still present because we can see his brush stroke and it adds this liveliness to the figure as well. I also want to talk about the work of Johannes Vermeer or Jan Vermeer is the shortened version of his name. And we'll be looking at this work called The Geographer, which dates to 1668. He was a Dutch painter from the area called Delft. He had a short life and career, only about 36 paintings survive from his career, but he's one of the most famous Dutch artists of the 17th century, probably second only to Rembrandt. He has a technical mastery, and he think, I think he's a really nice contrast to Halls because he wants that perfectly smooth surface. He was a very sophisticated artist. His works just didn't look like anything else from this time. With his work, we see a strong interest in optics, color, and light, which was actually quite ahead of his time. It's something that becomes a preoccupation of 19th century artists, which we'll talk about in a couple of modules. He painted mostly what are called genre scenes, and this means scenes of everyday life. And this was another very common subject for Dutch artists, because remember, the people looking at art in this period, the Dutch people are very interested in their surroundings, in their everyday life. They're quite naturalistic. We see contemporary settings, themes, and people, but often they have a sort of moralizing undertone. There is some symbolism typically instilled in his paintings, which remember that is the tradition from earlier Flemish artists. Think back to the Marode altarpiece, or the Portinari altarpiece, or the Arnolfini portrait. But now you see the symbolism removed from overt religious contexts. I think Vermeer is a really good example of the possibility of mastering the technique of light in painting. So you don't have to go to the extremes of chiaroscuro to show the ability to illuminate a scene. You see this light flooding into this interior. And Vermeer's scenes I would say 90% of them are composed in a very similar way. In the corner of a room, on the left side, you see this window coming in. There's usually a figure standing at a table. There's usually something on the wall, maybe a chair in the background. So we get a really good sense of what his studio was like. They're very nuanced scenes, atmospheric, soft, and even just a little bit abstracted. So if you start looking at this rug, this carpet on the table, you start to see that it's actually kind of abstracted. It's a bit stylized. You just have these patches of color. It almost reminds me of somebody like Matisse in the early 20th century because the focus is not on this carpet, but it's on the effects of light in this space. It's thought that he probably used what's called a camera obscura, which was a shuttered box or room that had a small hole in one side. And then through that little hole, light from a brightly lit scene would enter and would form an inverted image on a screen placed opposite the hole. Then the artist could go in and trace the outlines um, and, and paint from this projected image. The fact that light is entering through a single hole and then it's an inverted images on a, image on a screen, it's basically identical with the photographic camera. For a greater convenience, uh, a camera obscura usually had a mirror to reflect the image the right way up 
and then it would be put onto a suitably placed drawing surface. And I thought this camera obscura is maybe one of the reasons he's got this sort of fuzzy quality to some of his works, um, how things aren't quite in focus, or in other cases, sometimes things are too over-focused, that your eye doesn't actually see that way necessarily, that your eye focuses on one object and things blur into the background. So there's a lot of debate about whether or not he used this camera obscura, although most art historians agree that he probably did. He also had these very subtle modulations of color, and Vermeer was one of the first artists to acknowledge the fact that shadows aren't really just black. Shadows are informed by whatever is around them, the colors that are around them, so you see that instead of just painting black or adding black to whatever pigment, he actually makes some sort of bluish or you can even see a little bit of orange in the shadow in the background here, for example. And that's exactly how light actually works. So he was really interested in optics. So in this scene, we see a figure of a geographer. He actually painted this figure more than once using the same model here, wearing very similar clothing. We see him holding a compass in his hand, and he's working with some piece of paper unfurled on this table. And we see him caught in this pensive moment. And a certain alertness conveys this intellectual energy. All of the elements in the background are chosen with care by Vermeer. So the geographer is working with this compass, and he's probably got an unfurled map down here of some sort or a survey. But in the background, notice we also have this globe. And on the back wall, we have a map. It's a way of also making reference to the exterior world, even though we're seeing the geographer in this interior room. And this exterior world is really what the Dutch are all about. Remember, there are significant traders. The Dutch East Indies Company is founded in the 17th century, so they're traveling around the world. They're one of the major leaders in trade in Asia, so they're really about discovering the outside world, mapping, understanding that exterior world. My favorite thing about Vermeer is his ability to depict light. Now, if you look at this carpet, you see these little points of light. They have this sort of pearl-like quality, and this is characteristic of all of his paintings. You see it hitting this chest here. You see it off the wood of the globe, and if you look at these things in person, Vermeer's works are often quite small. You see that they're perfect little points of white to add that highlight. The last thing I should say about this painting is that the signature and date are added later. These are not original. Vermeer doesn't typically sign his works. He has kind of a tragic end to his life. He dies of some sudden illness when he's quite young in significant amount of debt. His wife tried to hide paintings so that they couldn't be taken away. He becomes much more famous after his death, although he did achieve some success during his lifetime as well. Now I want to talk about one more genre that we see rising in the Dutch Republic in the 17th century. So we've talked about group portraits, portraits. We've looked at a genre scene. Also prevalent were landscapes and seascapes, cityscapes. Also, though, we see a rise in still life subjects. I'm showing you an example of a still life by Maria van Oosterwijk, and this is called a Vanitas still life. That's the, the title it's been given as well, and it dates to 1668. Still lives become this popular theme because they're a secular subject matter, but they can also be invested with a lot of symbolic content, which I'll talk about in a moment. There are also depictions of the accumulated wealth and possessions of the Dutch, because remember, they're getting more money at this time. They're not just collecting art, they're expanding their libraries, they're collecting curiosity objects, they're trading with foreign countries, so they're getting a lot of different objects accumulated as personal possessions. They often have moralizing overtones, and this is definitely a good example of that. The composition is very carefully crafted. This isn't an accidental placing of objects, but very carefully composed to convey a sense of wealth and prosperity of whoever was going to own this, but also to invest these moralizing overtones. Here we see a vase of flowers, which is actually a symbol of economic prosperity of the Dutch, especially this tulip bulb just about to bloom. Tulips were a major export of the Dutch, and they were extremely expensive. We think now of tulips and Holland, but they were something that cost so much money. I had a, a professor once tell me that basically one tulip bulb cost the same 
as what a baker would make in a yearly salary. So they were very, very expensive and symbols of wealth. To have all of these beautiful flowers in bloom at once was pretty extraordinary. The skull is hopefully an obvious reference to death. You also have a stalk of grain lying here, as well as a partially eaten ear of corn which also refers to the passing of time. Somebody's been here. You have this little mouse here who's nibbling on this grain. The hourglass is another very straightforward symbol of time passing. So Vanitas paintings are about the transience of life. And Vanitas, as you imagine, can translate simply as vanity, but it's this idea that vanity is this passing thing, that you are not always going to have this wealth because eventually you're going to die and you cannot take it with you. So Vanitas de Lux often incorporates symbols of death, and again, the skull is the most straightforward example of that. The skull is something we call a memento mori, a reminder of death. With the skull and the timepiece, you see this very clear emphasis on the passing of time and how anybody looking at this will eventually die. So the vanities in life are transient. They will not last forever. The book featured here has a title in that in Dutch means reckoning. So that's a subtle reference to the final accounting at the last judgment. So even though this isn't explicitly religious, it's got this religious undertone here. In this carafe of whatever liquid we have here, notice the reflection coming in here. You see the light from a window. And if you look closely, you can actually see the face here. So we're seeing a reflection of the artist and the window in her studio. So it's another way of emphasizing the artist in the work. We talked about that with Halls and his quick, loose brush strokes. But also including a self-portrait like this is a way of including the creator in the work. It's also a really nice way of showing the artist's virtuosity with reflective surfaces. So each item works together as a warning against folly. Behave yourself even though you're rich now. You still have to go to the final reckoning at the last judgment. And so you need to spend your wealth well and behave yourself. So it's, it's another moralizing message, not that different from any of the last judgments we've talked about, although it's done in a much more subtle way and in a very specifically Dutch way. So to wrap up, remember we talked about France, specifically art under Louis XIV. We looked at the portrait of him by Hyacinth Rigaud, this idea of the absolute monarch. And we looked at the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, this glorious palace, an exemplum of the wealth of France. We also talked about Flanders and the idea of Catholic Northern Europe with the artist Peter Paul Rubens. Finally, we talked about the Dutch Republic, an area that was distinctly Protestant but was still very interested in art and collecting objects since they were a wealthy middle class. But the major thing is we see a rise in new subject matters. Landscapes, portraits, group portraits, still lives, and genre scenes are the major new types of subject matter. Of course, we see some of these before but they really rise to the fore in the Dutch Republic in this golden age of the 17th century. So now to wrap up module 12, you have the self-assessment to take like always. You'll find a discussion board prompt related to Rembrandt's The Night Watch. And finally, the vocabulary wiki is the responsibility of group three this time. So thank you for watching and I will see you for module 13.